Welcome to this Autism Ontario webinar. My name is Matthew Lay, and as always, I will be your host. But things are a little bit different. Um, no longer am I on the Autism Ontario desk due to um, COVID-19 and what we are all experiencing. I'm at home on a webcam, um, the way that so many of us are spending our days. And today we have a very topical presentation for everyone. We're gonna be talking about being social at work. And our guest today has been on the desk before. Uh, this is our first time working together um, on in this virtual setting. And it is uh, Sarah Southey, therapist and employment coach at the Red Path Center in Toronto with over 12 years experience. Sarah, thanks for, uh, thanks for joining us virtually today. Thank you, I'm happy to be here and it's good to see you again. It is good to see you, if only through the magic of the interwebs. Um, mm -hmm. I think our audience is probably pretty uh, well versed in what the Red Path Center is, but for those of them who aren't, maybe you can give them just a little bit of uh, uh, an overview for us. Sure, so the Red Path Center is uh, a place in Toronto. It's a clinic that assesses individuals who are on the autism spectrum, uh, whether they be a child or even an adult, even a senior. Uh, and then there's also a multidisciplinary team that provides intervention, behavioral intervention, counseling, therapy, uh, speech pathology. And uh, we're primarily located out of Toronto. And then we have affiliates across the province. And I think one affiliate as well out in BC. Yeah, so that's a little bit about the Red Path Center. Okay. And um, your job within within that is primarily working on the um, um, you're working in employment therapy. That's a big part of what it is that you do. Right. So uh, my background, so I started doing employment counseling uh, probably close to 15 years ago. I used to work at the John Howard Society with high risk youth. Uh, and then I took my labor studies degree and went back to school for social work and did a master's in that, uh, where I learned a lot about autism at that time. And then after that, this was well over a decade ago. So back then there was really like literally nothing going on for individuals with ASD at that time who were trying to yeah. find more meaningful work, very, very little. Uh, so then since that time, I've been doing a lot of employment coaching and counseling individually with people, trying to get them uh, figuring out what they might like to do and finding meaningful work. Excellent. Okay. Um, I do need to handle the um, uh, the housekeeping items here. So just a, a few things. You guys should be pretty comfortable with the interface. Big part of my job today is going to be getting questions, your questions answered by Sarah. So you can go ahead and put them through the ask a question box. I'll be monitoring those and looking to get you looking to get you information as it relates to the um, to the handout section. That's the resources. That's where we house information that is pertinent to our uh, conversation. There are a number of items in there, including this deck that's got some templates and some items that um, are going to be important to our to our dialogue and to our conversation and some additional links embedded in the PowerPoint that I think you should all check out. So I'll be bringing out the handouts from time to time. Make sure you go in, download them and, uh, and access them before you leave today. And um, if you have any issues, go ahead and um, and just um, um, hit the help button or send us a question. And we got some people here that are able to assist you. All right. With that being said, Let's get into why we are here today. We're going to be talking about a few items today. We are going to be talking about um, some challenges. We are going to be talking about um, being social at work, finding jobs in this in this weird, weird world. And um, I like what you started off here with is you started off with this uh, with this great um, this great sketch. Mm -hmm. What is it? Just talking about where did you find this and what's the story on this uh, on this cartoon right so this cartoon i i like to infuse in presentations sometimes because it's just a funny moment to kind of recognize that there are so so very many strengths that individuals on the spectrum possess uh this person who did the comic uh he's his, his website's called dudum and aspie and he does many different comics uh around different hot topics and in this one he's just the, the little caricature is correcting a memo and i thought that's so uh relative because so many of the clients that i work with are really detail oriented uh catch things that other people don't catch have really strong technical detail all those sorts of things right 
So um, there's many, many strengths. Uh, actually, the presentation that I did earlier in the week on Monday, there's a webinar about assessing interesting um uh, kind of figuring out your strengths, assessing your strengths and interests. And uh, you may want to look back at that. It is available as one of the uh, links from today as well, if you want to learn more about your own strengths. But it is important to you know acknowledge that there's so many wonderful strengths that individuals on the spectrum have before we talk about some of the challenges that are also present. And um, I, I was a little disappointed to hear that that wasn't a Sarah um, Southie cartoon. So I will challenge you that when we come on next time that I'd like to see one of your own uh, your own drawings like that. Um, Sarah, I got to advise you that I'm with you in, in, in not being able to see the slides in the big window. Um, the audience, I'm told, is seeing it. And so if you need to pull up the deck, I apologize, but we're working on it so that you and me can uh, can see them in a, in a in a larger way. Nothing like giving you this the first time we're doing it virtually and throwing a little bit of a twist at you. But um, but that is that is the technology. So. We started off on a positive note, which I love, and now we're now we're going to be talking about uh, some of the challenges because there are challenges. Um, so mm -hmm. let's let's dive in there. Where do we generally get started when we we think about challenges within this specific um, this specific dem demographic? Right. So today, um, one of the main challenges we're talking about is being social in the workplace. And that's a huge challenge, uh, as we know, um, from from anecdotal experience. So people saying it's a big problem for them. And then also the literature would reflect that when surveying adults on the spectrum who are working or who are looking for work, most of the co the most common stressor, the most um, pressing issue is the the being social. So that's really interesting to note because it's not necessarily the actual work tasks. Very um, seldomly is it the I'm struggling with my actual workload uh, and what I'm asked to do and meeting deliverables, but mostly it is the social interactions, whether it be at the interview stage or being social with colleagues. Um, so that's a big challenge for sure. And then uh, another huge, huge challenge is uh, the uh, supervisors and bosses, as well as human resources, not really understanding, not really creating a culture that may um, may help uh, with diversity initiatives, uh, not really being aware of what the heck autism spectrum disorder actually means. Um, yeah. Such training may not be suitable. Uh, uh, so that's a big one, too. And work uh, in the community, finding resources in the community can be difficult, particularly in more remote communities. That's a really big challenge. So figuring out who in your community may be able to help you find a job. We know that there are a lot of different employment resource centers, but sometimes it's difficult to find ones that may specialize in supporting those on the autism spectrum. And then lastly, another, another common one that's reported is that work activity may not be meaningful. So a lot of people on the spectrum are either unemployed or underemployed, meaning that they may be doing work that is not really connected with what they want to be doing um, if they are doing work. OK, um, you may have the answer to this, um, but um, are you doing another webinar on a similar topic um, tomorrow evening as well? How closely related are these two are these two webinars? One of our audience members is asking. Oh, good question. Um, so this actually uh, so things kind of turned upside down when uh, when um, COVID-19 hit. And so this is actually the webinar that was intended to be tomorrow. So there is no webinar tomorrow evening. So scratch that from your calendar. This is the webinar that was intended for tomorrow evening. And, um, and then since that time, in addition to the webinar that was shifted to today, there uh, is a total of five others. And you can go to Autism Ontario for all the specific dates. Um, but basically, it's it's uh, on Mondays from 12 to 1, the last two Mondays and three Mondays to come. So um, a handful of different topics there that might be interesting or relevant as well, for sure. It's not going to be any overlap, um, maybe a few key points, but, but a handful of different uh, uh, free webinars to access. So that could be helpful. Excellent. And that's going to be available on a brand new section of the Autism Ontario website. It's connecting with us virtually and there's a bunch of great um, uh, items on there. And we've gone and um, added um, in the resource um, in the resource section, we've gone in and we've added a few um, of your past webinars um, that you most recently did, um, mm -hmm. employment readiness, job searching and COVID-19 and, and career marching. So there's a few other ones that are here with the other resources and um, and basically um, and clearly the upcoming ones, uh, you've just given us sort of the sort of the schedule on that. Right, right. So 
we know that there are challenges. I mean, this is nothing new. There's challenges mm -hmm. both, you know, in the workplace, awareness, even though all the great work that Autism Ontario is doing and all the great work that, that uh, people like yourself are doing. And unfortunately, this audience knows all too well about the problems in finding resources. And you mentioned it as we always have to, especially in remote communities, which uh, which may be a benefit of this virtual, the virtual, going everyone going virtual to provide more of that kind of help. But um, the one of the big things that's going to come up is going to be disclosure right. and what you disclose and the like. So what are the best practices around disclosure? What do you tell your, you know, your people, your, the, your, the people that you're counseling and you're working with? Right. So the, I think the most important thing about disclosure is that there's no right or wrong time to disclose and there's no right or wrong decision that you have to disclose. Uh, so the slide that um, around questions to consider uh, really walks people through some questions that might help them with figuring out timing to disclose. So just to kind of give you some perspective, some people that I work with disclose prior to some people disclose prior to uh, their job search even starting and they disclose on a cover letter when they just kind of write out uh, the resume and they're submitting that with every application so that they're ma making sure that right from the get-go their employer is very well aware, uh, the future employer, and uh, making that known right, right up front. Other people will disclose at the time of an interview. Um, and that would be a good, it would definitely be good to disclose at the time of an interview if you feel like uh, you have um, uh, quite nervous tics or behaviors that may, be, may come across as peculiar to those who may not necessarily understand otherwise, right? So um, some people that I work with who are very fidgety may bring a stress ball or something like that into uh, into a an interview. And in that situation, they may, uh, they may be disclosing a formal diagnosis if that's helpful for them, or they might say something like, oh, you know, I um, I do get quite stressed and nervous in interviews, so I'd like to have a stress ball with me. So again, even if there are some um, some some parts of your ASD that are that are being uh, kind of put on the table when you're in an interview, you can there's a number of different ways to describe what's going on for you. And it doesn't have to be a direct disclosure if you prefer to keep it more private at that time. Uh, and then another time where people might disclose is once they're hired. And uh, that's a really nice time to disclose. I would suggest because at that point you've got the job and the really great thing about that is that if your supervisor can know from the get-go about some of the best ways to communicate with you put a few accommodations into place then that's a really really good thing uh, then right from day one you're having good positive communication hopefully and your boss is trying to support you and then otherwise, um, some people will wait till they meet their 90 day uh, mark, because we do know uh, that unfortunately, in their first 90 days, you can be uh, fired for any possible reason, and they don't have to give notice. So there is that potential. I don't want to, you know, assume the worst in anybody, but there is the potential that you could be fired um, or if someone doesn't understand or care to understand, if they're not really very nice of a person or very ethical, then you could be fired soon. You could be fired for something um, relating to your diagnosis and they wouldn't have to actually uh, disclose why they're, 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 they're terminating your employment. So um, that is another time to disclose. But generally I would say that I don't see that happening. And uh, I would say that the research has now shown that it is best to disclose in employment. So when I was doing this kind of work, even like five years ago, there wasn't much literature around it back then, around when to disclose or how to disclose. But more recently, some has emerged. And what I'm seeing is that uh, that if employers know that the individual has autism spectrum disorder, the individual with autism spectrum disorder is more likely to report satisfaction in their work and um, stay in the job longer. And there's a number of uh, resources in the reference pages that can, that can uh, for anyone who's interested in reading more about the specific studies, there is some information in the reference pages about that, okay? Um, what, do you, what do you attribute, so we talked about, you know, there's a problem with possible awareness, what the heck is autism spectrum disorder you had referenced earlier, mm -hmm. but then you're saying that when we, um, um, that when we um, disclose that there's a level of, I just got a really funny question and they said, who's the guy on the right? I'm nobody. 
Um, I am just the host. So this is your first webinar that you've been on with me. Um, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm just the host. I, uh, I help out asking questions basically, but I'm nobody and no one important. So you don't, don't worry that you missed the beginning. Um, so, but what do you attribute to the fact that disclosure is helping? That, that's gotta be an awareness thing is, or maybe potentially some changes in, in legislation. What, what do you attribute to that? Right. So certainly I am obviously not a lawyer um, and there was that great presentation that you hosted, uh, I think last month uh, with yep. with a labor lawyer, which would be great to refer back to if you did have more legal specific questions. But my um, my impression of why uh, why things have changed with disclosure is, uh, is absolutely due to increased awareness of autism, particularly okay. in the tech industry. The tech industry is uh, a great a great champion and leader of hiring practices around um, trying to make sure environments are inclusive and hiring people who are on the spectrum and specifically recruiting people on the spectrum because of their immense talent and ways of thinking through things dif differently. Right. So that's a lot of it. Uh -huh. I think um, I think we sort of handled this, but we have a we have a question about. I mean, the the research that you could point us to says that disclosing is generally better, but what about those that are only exhibit sort of minor symptoms? Those that are you know that generally pass off you know not being um, not being on the spectrum. Do you have different recommendations for those? Uh, well, I think that. Um we need to, you know, you need to think about it on a case by case basis and every individual is different. There's no one best answer, right? But right. I, what I would suggest to do to think back about figuring out if it is the appropriate thing for you to do is think back to if you've had accommodations in school before, were they helpful? Um, have you had successes or challenges in past work environments? What does that look like? If you have, you know, it, it may not be visible, right? We know a lot of autism is not necessarily visible, but if there are communication issues that are happening and that there are patterns of that, then it could be good to disclose. And the other important thing to think about is who do you disclose to, right? So that's really big because there's, there's, um, it's really important and that's why I'm suggesting that you think through these kinds of things now if maybe you're not working you're between jobs and you're thinking about getting ready to get back to work when uh, COVID-19 uh, allows us to do so um, because it is so complex the issue so some people that I work with disclose to just their manager or supervisor and maybe a peer if they have a mentor on the team they make disclose to them um, other people that I work with their whole team knows and they're proud and it works and it's great it's great for them depending on the work environment um, other people that I that I work with just want to just close to human resources and not even have their immediate manager know, but they want human resources to know so that in case they ever need to get more help in a quick way, then at least human resources is already on board and uh, things may be able to move forward a little bit quickly, more quicker. And I imagine the type of business that you're working at, applying for and the like can impact that as well. I mean, you could be sitting in a developer pit or you're working for an organization like some of the major banks in Canada that have, you know, published um, um, uh, uh, policies around around you know working with folks. It's different than going to potentially a smaller startup with less with less people where you don't really know um, mm -hmm. how accommodating they can be from an economic perspective. So. Um, uh, clearly a lot goes into it but the default yeah. is the um is uh is is disclosed early based around around the research now i right. love when this happens i love when this happens because our next um um question leads us into our next slide the great template that you gave us for disclosure because right. people are looking for uh first off for some tips on how to do this when yeah. they're the question was when it's clear on your resume that you may be on the spectrum or there's some in your job history there's some there's some clarity already provided you know what's a good idea and you've got this great you know template letter that's available in the resources and the like talk us through this and what this helps uh, helps accomplish sure and very good point that that person made who wrote in the question because certainly a lot of people that i work with do have experience um that is listed on their resume about being like an autism advocate or that sort of thing uh on their experience maybe volunteering for somewhere or maybe being involved in speaking engagements so sometimes it's very um, apparent if someone actually reads through your resume but it does need to go further than just disclosing in that way so that's where a disclosure letter comes in and the reason i always recommend a letter is because it's in your words then, and it's and it's a reflection of what autism spectrum disorder means for you and how it impacts you directly. 
I, I do not suggest to ever actually bring in as a first point of discussion a, um, a letter from a physician or a psychologist that would be your full diagnostic report. I generally recommend to not do that because the clinical jargon is oftentimes well beyond uh, what employers are comfortable in understanding or able to understand. Uh, it certainly, could it, sound, it could probably make it sound a lot worse than it is if they've never seen some of that terminology before and it could cause some concerns on their front that they probably don't need to have. Certainly, it's just confusing for most people, right? That a lot of individuals don't really know how to interpret psychological reports and assessments. And I'm in the field, I'm a social worker, but I interpret a lot of uh, psychological reports and sometimes I get confused with what they mean and what all the percentiles mean. And it's highly personal too, right? Uh, so, because they go back and tell a whole history a lot of the time. So what's most important to do in a disclosure letter is start with the positives about yourself. Start with a handful of things that you know you're good at really come from that positive lens. And then you want to say a line or two about what autism spectrum disorder means to you. Don't go back and quote the diagnostic manual because again, that's medical jargon that your employer probably won't interpret or understand very well. Um, and then go on to say what actually some of the challenges are that you have. Uh, so in this template, uh, this person mentions that they sometimes have difficulty processing information that they hear. So they struggle with the auditory piece. Uh, so when given a lot of information at one time, it's too much. So instead that person will write short notes down that they can refer to later. Perhaps another accommodation for that person would be an iPad or something like that to have in the moment. Um, and then this person mentions that they, they prefer written instructions. Very simple things, very easy to accommodate. Then all of a sudden your employer is not thinking, what the heck do I do? Do I need to go talk to HR now? How do I manage this? It just becomes a communication between you and your manager, hopefully as, as a starting point potentially. And they can uh, start enacting those pieces really easily and quickly without extra cost or burden to the company in any way. Um, great, um, um, some great advice there. I got one more question we're going to transition now to being in the workplace a little bit mm -hmm. um and then we're going to go on something else we got a, a great question here that it's um it's pretty involved i recently failed a government job interview where the format was completely different from what i expected and i was told i didn't mm -hmm. ask for accommodations beforehand because i expected the format um i expected the format to be a certain way as a result i did not have enough time to process the interview questions beforehand and came across as unprepared what would you suggest if you had this person walking into your office? Clearly, you might need some more information, but what are some suggestions for that? I would, to be honest with you, I would suggest that person probably uh, think about trying to reach back out to the hiring team and consider disclosing and consider another opportunity at an interview. Uh, I would request, I would suggest that they request for the interview questions in advance. I would suggest that if it was a team of people interviewing them, that they ask as an accommodation to be interviewed by uh, a smaller panel or even just one person only. I'd also suggest that the specific person tune into the interview workshop that we have coming up two Mondays from now. Um, and I'll go through interview accommodations and how to prepare, how to walk through interviews with a little bit uh, more detail then. But certainly we know that most government jobs are typically good at being supportive employers. Uh, so human resources would not probably be taken back or confused uh, in, in that request and hopefully would understand that circumstances were uh, uh, you know, kind of mixed up and confused there a little bit uh, because it wasn't the interview we were expecting um, and that kind of put some pressure on you and you didn't perform the way that you wanted to there. I hope that they would understand that and I would certainly suggest re-engaging in that particular situation. Okay, we've got a lot of good questions coming in. So I'm, I'm going to stick with this for a bit before we move on to in the workplace. And I know that we've got to make up some time here, but I think it's I think it's important with where this is going. First okay. off, for those of you who are asking about volunteer positions, we're going to touch on that a little bit later on. So what I'd like to, uh, the first question I'd like to ask and, and, and in case I'm understanding on is, do you think that when the, would a disclosure letter similar to what you put forward make sense as part of the process, like included within that asking for your accommodations and, and suggesting those? Or um, do you suggest separating those two things, disclose and then mm -hmm. ask for accommodations if you need them? Okay, so would the sample disclosure letter be appropriate? Um, when asking for accommodation in that job application process. So I would suggest that they're two separate things. I would usually say keep them separate. Um, mm -hmm. 
I would say that a nice piece to do first is to put it on people's radars that, yep, I'm someone living with autism spectrum disorder. Here's what it means to me and keep that relatively informal. And you'll see in the template, like there were some teasers, kind of samples of different accommodations that could be used, but I wouldn't want that to become the binding only document, um, or that's the whole, the whole thing at once. Because usually when you're actually initiating formal accommodations, a lot of times at their formal accommodations, human resources is involved. A lot of people that I work with actually have informal accommodations, which there's some cl complexities to that because if they're informal, then if the manager changes that sort of thing, then you don't have them guaranteed anymore. Um, yeah. But the point of that was, is that there are, um, there are different levels and, and, and kind of situations within the communications to make sure that your accommodations are best supporting you. You may want formal or informal. Um, if you want formal, then typically human resources is involved. So you may want to need, you may need a second document. You may need to go back and reflect on um, things more specifically uh, to get that more formalized list. And um, there's another question here about what if you're not those things listed on slide 11? I assume this is a template and you should there's, there's areas that should be personalized. Do you have any other input on that? Yeah. So, yeah, that would not be the case for everybody, right? And we know that right. you've met one person with autism, you've met one person with autism. So what right. you would do is you would still, so the, so you're always going to start with your strengths. You're always going to have a statement or two about amazing things that you're good at. The employer probably would already know if they've met you a little bit about some of the great abilities and talents you have, especially if they've read your resume, but you start with that. And then you're going to do a brief one or two liner about what autism spectrum disorder is. Um, and you could use the, probably the, the information from the slot, from the example there or information of your own, but again, don't get overly technical. And then the next thing you're going to do is then that's the paragraph where you're going to definitely switch it up and say, okay, what are your specific challenges on the job? And what are the pieces of, what are the small things, what are the areas that the employer can make small changes in to make things a little bit easier for you to do your best job, to best accommodate you. So a handful of things that they can do. So it's not your formal list of accommodations, but definitely you are talking about a handful of things that they can start to try to do to help you. Okay, so we've gotten through the interview um and we are uh we are here um mm -hmm. and we are um um we got a job so there's some so you got some tips for uh, operating within the workforce uh within the workplace as well right so so i just like to include this slide because i think that it's uh difficult to talk about working without actually giving any suggestions as to how to work day to day and manage day to day. We're going to be talking in a little bit about being so like more the social aspects of work. Um, and so these are just general strategies and tips to help you get through day to day um, so that you're in a better place to, uh, to to be social later on, that sort of thing. So certainly things that you want to be thinking about that you might need in your in your uh, workplace would be that consistency. So that's good to be thinking about. So what could consistency look like? How can your employer ensure consistency in the accommodations that they're offering to you if you disclose? So would that mean that you'd have a regular time to meet each week? Would that mean that you, they are not adding new tasks to your plate unless you are, um, unless they communicate it in writing to you first so you don't get overwhelmed possibly in that moment if they're giving you new verbal instruction? What does that look like? What does the structure look like? Um, what are the visual supports looking like as well? So are they sending emails? Are there visual cues like an email train to prompt your memory and, and think back to maybe new tasks, assignments, that sort of thing? Are they using clear and direct language? Are they getting caught up in a lot of unnecessary wording and making the instructions far too complex? Well, that's an important thing to be thinking about that you might need uh, to, to work through in your communication with them a little bit. Uh, and then the other thing is being proactive where possible. So trying not to let issues build up. And that's why it is so good to potentially disclose early on. And then my last point there is don't underestimate the power of your physical environment. And that's relevant more than ever right now for those who maybe are working at home and finding more success at home. Um, thinking about that a little bit, what would um, an environment look like if you're, if you're right by, if you're in a cubicle situation right near the washroom, what kinds of, uh, what kinds of issues are coming up there and make those need to be accommodated for, may that be something that's important to write in your disclosure letter or in um, a request for formal accommodations, maybe uh, where, where you're um, sitting in the office, a quiet space a lot of times can do a lot for a lot of people. And, uh, you know, I love, I love when we, we hit these things, they seem, 
that they're, you're, you're, you're speaking directly to those on the spectrum who you've dealt with, but everything you just talked about is what anyone should think about when, when entering into a new job. And mm. it's just good, good stuff that people should, it's good advice that everyone should be considering because they want to be, you know, at their, um, operating at the, at the best possible way they can. And so often it's like, I got a job, where do I sit? What is it that I do? And, and, you know, you're, you're, Mm -hmm. You're the receiver and the boss is the is the teller, especially when you're when you're young in your career. Those are those are great tips for for, for everyone. Right. Okay. Now we're gonna we're gonna transition a bit here and we're gonna we're gonna start talking about um we're gonna start talking about job searching. Mm -hmm. And we're gonna get into looking for work. And this is where we're gonna get into some of the uh, we're gonna talk a little bit about volunteering for a question that's pending right now and, and the like. But you start off with the life cycle. Uh, something that I think they talked to us about, you know, sort of in uh, grade 12 back many, many mm -hmm. months ago when I was in school and we were uh, getting ready for the workforce. So um, that life cycle seems to be sort of straightforward um, for myself. What, what is it here? Why do you start here? And what are, what are you what are you communicating to 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 our audience with this? Right. So the point of this slide is typically to uh, if, if there's any um, teens, young adults who haven't gone through this before, um, then it's good to kind of think about what are the steps that are involved, right? Because it is a whole new world, the idea of searching for a job. Some people maybe have never done it before, so it's good to understand that. And I know that uh, a lot of people that I talk to about their um, grade, uh, their civics courses, their civics and career courses that are offered in high school now, I think that there's some really great content in them, but I don't think a lot of people really recall that content very much time after they finish the courses. It surprises me actually how, how little takeaways there are from those courses, unfortunately. So it's just kind of a refresher of the cycle of finding employment. So determining what you want to do and what you're qualified for, that's a really big step. So a lot of people that I work with struggle in that area. Um, again, going to look at that career um, interest, uh, Presentation would be a very good way to start to get thinking about that. Then preparing your resume and cover letter, that can be uh, quite an onerous task. So I like to kind of put it out there that uh, is a major step. And certainly right now, during the time of COVID-19, we're all stuck at home. It is a great time to be working on these first two components. So really sitting down and thinking what you like. Maybe you've been laid off and now is a great opportunity to think about where else could I be working that I may enjoy more um, and trying to start taking courses, make moves to try to shift employment interests or employment um, skills uh, so that they are more aligned with your interests. Sitting down, going through several edits of your resume, having family, friends review it, uh, that sort of thing is, is, is a good thing to be doing right now too. And then you come to your actual job search. So that's really something that I stress, particularly with individuals who relate to ASD. This is a main part of the uh, main part of the, the the work because it's a difficult thing to get accustomed to to taking that time, building it into your routine, making a new routine, and then using your executive functioning skills, that planning and organizing ability, to actually go and uh, make that time, do those follow ups. It's 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 engaging other people a lot of times when you're sending around sending applications out and all those pieces can be really overwhelming and really challenging so I like that's to really the hardest part because when you don't get uh, an immediate acceptance or whatever especially if it's the you know that job that you just loved or that you were really looking forward to it feels like rejection without even getting a chance at the table so um i think for everybody that that's really the hard part of hard part of the cycle is just recognizing that it's a bit of a numbers game and it's and it's about you know getting out there as much as humanly possible mm -hmm, mm -hmm. um definitely and then uh and then the interview usually comes next uh and then accepting the job signing the contract attending orientation and of course, becoming comfortable and familiar in the position. So I, when I'm doing groups with teens, a lot of times take like job vocabulary words and do like a kind of like a matching activity where there might be a word like, what does um, reference mean? And then they would match up that references, um, something that someone would give you to attest to your skills and abilities. Uh, so I just like to go and keep it simple, bring it back to this slide uh, so that we're all on the same page in terms of language and we're all aware of the steps that happen. Um, I think that too often uh, we, we forget all the steps. And I also think if there's any parents who are listening, parents of young adults, uh, it's good to reflect on what the steps are now because they may look a little bit different than how they used to look. When I started doing employment counseling, 
um, over a decade ago, and this is dating myself a little bit, but people exclusively at that point in time would be taking their resume and going door to door. There were no online applications really yet. It was very yeah. few far between. So it's a different process. And certainly for parents tuning in, it's important to be aware of the different steps uh, that, that we approach the job, job finding with now. Yeah, there's a lot of great resources out there. I know that you're going to point to some, but interestingly enough, um, a lot of the marketing that staffing companies put out is full mm -hmm. of all this stuff, tips, tricks, how to's, templates, mm -hmm. basically how they <laughs> find their new candidates and they're always searching for them. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, very, 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 very interesting stuff. So we get into, uh, we get into the search and I love mm -hmm. your first one. This is one that, you know, anytime someone gets, you know, someone in my personal social network is looking and they get disgruntled, I always say, look, you got to treat it like a job. You got to get up in the morning. Mm -hmm. You got to be doing it the whole, the kind of the whole day, and, and treat it like that. But you know, what are what are tips for people who are um, who are in the job search right now? And mm -hmm. I may follow up with a little bit about um, um, a little bit about you know this new world and what changes with that. But could, go through the slide right. and let's talk. Let's talk through it. Sure. So if you were job searching as of a couple of weeks ago, or are still job searching now, I think the biggest thing to take away right now is that um goal setting is essential uh because your your goals have shifted the entire world has shifted so even if your goals haven't shifted i'm suggesting that you shift them a little bit um so maybe that you're setting goals that if you wanted to be working in your first um job uh let's say you want to be working as um uh, someone doing some IT work and that and you've, you've done some courses and you're ready to go. You've got to set the goal a little bit beyond uh, timing wise when you may have been thinking that you might do that. And typically, I would suggest that people do set goals that they're applying to a certain number of jobs per week. Now, then I would never suggest setting the target super, super high. It needs to be attainable. Um, we want, you know, we want things to be realistic and we want you to reach your goals. Um, and also I would not suggest setting a super high number in general, uh, uh, typical times as well, because it's really about quality over quantity. So you do wanna make sure you're giving yourself time to switch up that cover letter, that sort of thing. Um, but right now, what I'm suggesting to a lot of people, and this is uh, this information is very much um, a part of the COVID-19 presentation I did uh, a week and a half ago, is that as opposed to doing your active job searching at the moment, I'm suggesting that people take the time to think about what other skills and training they may be able to do. So if you were usually set treating your job search like a job and maybe from 9 to 11 a.m. most mornings, you were online looking at new jobs, but you're finding you're not seeing any now, then I'm certainly suggesting that people look at what they may be able to do in terms of low cost or free courses that may be available. So um, I had mentioned Udemy as a possible good place to find some uh, different interesting skills and courses, uh, continuing education programs that are online at colleges and universities are still running and online. So that's good, good as well. Yeah, that was Udemy for those of you who didn't hear it. It's um, online, an online resource. And yeah, I mean, right now, I mean, I'm in the virtual communications. This is my business. These are the kind of things that I do. And and even, you know, as our business is expanding and stuff, we're being, uh, how do I say it, um, conservative with hiring, even though we, we, we need to be bringing people on. And that's just because we don't know what's going to happen with the economy. So I think most people are kind of in a, are in a bit of a whole pattern. Um, mm -hmm. Hopefully, what the government has done is is reduce the number of folks who will be unemployed with their with the the um, the reduction in the uh, qualifications for some of the COVID funding. But in general, there's not a lot of people who are who are looking to you know bring people on in in, in this space um, outside of that note we saw about Amazon and the ten thousand employees. Mm -hmm. um, so somebody already asked a question about tips um, for volunteering. I'm gonna move on here to slide 16. And and you, you recommend that in the job search right now, one of the things you suggest is to volunteer. So um, when you talk about that, can you answer this person's question that came in a while ago about any tips for looking for, um, for um, volunteer uh, positions? Sure. So definitely it's a good time to be trying to secure future volunteer positions whether they be um, face to face once COVID-19 is um, a little more managed or whether they be virtual volunteer positions right now so um, I'm not sure if the link is in this presentation but I will make sure that Ola from Autism Ontario thank you Ola for organizing everything for today um, I'll share that with Ola so that it can get to everybody but uh, for example right now the um, 
government of Canada is recruiting for volunteers that would be doing virtual work around um, tracking case numbers uh, and that's and different uh, different data collection pieces that may be really essential to managing the virus. Uh, and they're accepting applications until April 24th, I believe. Uh, so things like that are amazing opportunities right now and, and not typical opportunities, great way to contribute. Uh, to our, our community during a difficult time. Um, but otherwise, there's interesting things, like even um, lots of different nursing homes are are encouraging volunteers that may be able to be like remote volunteers calling in and talking to people on the phone. The, 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 so there are volunteer opportunities out there, they just look different than before. But even if you're thinking about volunteering face-to-face -face and that's you wanna be in person for volunteering, then I would not, um, I would not discourage people researching what opportunities might be available in the coming months and trying to connect and engage with companies still. Um, certainly they won't be starting anytime soon, but volunteer processes take some time, getting the police checks, uh, getting the training, those sorts of things uh, take some time. So certainly it would be a good idea to be looking into those pieces now. Okay. Great. Great to know. I found the website um, for that. It's um, do, uh, Government of Canada COVID-19 um, volunteers in Google search. You will find it, but we're going to get that added and get it out to get, get it out to everyone as well. Um, after volunteering, you recommend setting up a LinkedIn account, which, you know, in the in the professional community, it is it is where all of this kind of starts. Um, since I haven't been looking for a job and, you know, I'll date myself along with you there about 12 years. What? Um, is everyone that just set up a LinkedIn account now, no matter what it is that they're doing when they're going out, or is it, or is it still mainly for those looking to work in sort of professional office style environments? So I would suggest that it is a good practice for um, most individuals uh, if they're comfortable with it, uh, if they're comfortable setting up an account, right? If you're not comfortable with it, then um, I wouldn't suggest that that's, you know, an absolute must do, but it's a great thing that if you are certainly in a professional kind of role or looking to get into a professional kind of role, um, but even if you're not, it's still good to find out and learn more about companies, right? There, it's just a great way to follow different companies that are interesting to you and collect information on them um, in a professional context. So certainly I would say that that would be a good thing to do regardless of if you are, um, if you are, uh, regardless of the industry you're looking to get into. Um, and then the other point that I have along with that is registering for major job boards. So indeed.com, for example, you can register with Indeed and they will send you, if you set it up um, in such a way, they can send you jobs that match the search criteria that you're interested in. So uh, that's a great thing to do because we know right now the number of jobs coming through is not as steady as we'd probably like to see if we're job seeking. So that's a, a great, great way to make sure that you're getting emailed when jobs do match the descriptors that you're looking for in your area become available. And then, um, sorry, go ahead. There's other resources, right? I mean, there's other than online, there's, there's some, there's some, free or some available resources in the community to help people. What do those look like? What are what are those resources? Okay, so most communities uh, will have supported employment. I mean, really every community has supported employment programs. Um, many, unfortunately, as I mentioned earlier, are not specific to ASD, more in like um, rural settings, uh, but definitely there are still great resource centers regardless of where you are. And what I would do is uh, recommend that people look, uh, just do like a search in your community directories online, just search local employment resource center and, and uh, the city that you live in and, and you'll be directed to where that might be. Typically, those are face-to-face -face kind of businesses where you would go in, you'd be able to work on computers there, do photocopying, printing every resume, get get help that way. But I, as I mentioned, run? is that part of yeah. human resources? Committed? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, or um, sometimes like uh, Ontario, like it depends, like there's different sources of funding for different programs, um, but uh, they're they're free, they're government run, and. Uh, the other point that I want to make is that I used to work in that kind of work, and I do have some colleagues who still who 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 are uh, in those in those settings, um, and so I know that a lot of the work that way has switched to um, different like web uh, like online workshops that sort of thing, um, and they're trying to use remote platforms to continue to support people right now who are looking for jobs, particularly in essential services because that's really the only places where people are working. But there, I see I see adaptations being made, and it's kind of cool. 
Um, there's a question from the last slide that I think is interesting because there's a lot of ways to answer it, but it's, it, 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 you're looking for work. One of the, one of the things you need to do is just, you know, kind of let people know um, mm -hmm. that you are, both, and I think it's probably both personal, professional, anyone that you kind of encountered. What are some, some of your suggestions for, you know, how you just let people know that you're out there and you're on the market? Right. So, uh, it's really important the way that you approach that because you don't want to come across like you're asking for a job to anybody, um, for example, um, that could be that could come across too strong, right? So it's just as you're having communications with with family, friends, just saying, you know, if they're asking what you're up to lately, you may just say, oh, I'm, I'm starting to job search. And it's good if you can identify an industry that you're looking for work within. And it's very appropriate to always ask that if once you do mention that, oh, do you know anyone who might be in that industry? I'm just learn, looking to learn more about it, understand more companies in that industry, looking to connect with people who might be working in that field. So it's really uh, very appropriate to ask people um, if they have connections or contacts at all and uh, if they're willing to share that information and then it's up to you what you might may do with that um, informational interviews are always really really nice uh, I, I often will have a lot of parents also help when they're um, young adults are, are job searching, um, they may ask their friends and their and their networks, their professional networks as well. So letting your parents know if you're comfortable with them also kind of putting out the word that your job searching could could um, could connect you to a lead for sure too. Yeah, I've hired a couple people that way whose uh, parents mm -hmm. I had encountered in, uh, in business and they said, hey, you know, my son or daughter's looking for work. I'm not sure if you're in the right space, would you mind, you know, just interviewing mm -hmm. them and seeing seeing if there's something right for them and you know i think i've hired one of them but in general you know I, you know I, I was able to see you know they were looking at the job posting thinking that it was right for them and uh and it's yeah it, it really wasn't so it was good it was a good experience and that is uh, that is a good one we've got uh one of our guests has offered a a suggestion to us as well and they said that local community living programs are excellent as well because right. they often have employment teams and work with the population with disabilities and they understand what they can provide mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and i will add to that if you're looking and none of this is working autism ontario is the place to go connect with them virtually, connect with your uh, connect with your team there and they will be able to assist you, get you in touch with Sarah or, or something else. Um, the, uh, the last point that you that you have on here is, you know, seek out uh, those employers who um, have a commitment to diversity. How do you find those? Is there like a list of everyone or what's the best way of, uh, of doing that? So I'm just flipping ahead and I do on my last slide, it's the actual last last website that I referenced. So you gotta go all the way to the end if you're interested at the end on finding out those employers specifically. Um, but there is a website, it's called Canada's top dot, top100.com and then slash diversity. And those are the employers who are award-winning in Canada for uh, their diversity efforts and initiatives. So yeah, that's that's where I would suggest figuring that out as a first step um, because that's those are the those are the top players there. Excellent. I moved to the last slide, but you guys can also get it, uh, the slide deck with that link in it um, in the handouts section. So at this point, I'm just doing a bit of a time check. We got about 13 minutes left and we got a lot of, um, I think, really good content to get into. And that is the social side. But there was a question earlier about people losing momentum, especially with COVID um, going on where people are maybe you know, we're hiring and it pulled down those shops. And you put up a great resource that I like to talk about before we move on. And that is the uh, the job tracking resource that's available in the slides as well. Yep, so you read my mind there, Matt. It's very much um, that losing momentum is is really, really common for job seekers. Um, and in typical days when we're not dealing with COVID-19, one of the first things that I have people do when I start working with them is start a job search tracker because I find that sometimes individuals either are discouraged and burnt out and they're not applying to as many jobs as they think they are or we also use it to keep to collect evidence and to collect data that says oh well you know you've applied to 20 or so jobs but you haven't had a call back from anything well what's going on there are you applying to the right kind of jobs are you doing any kind of follow-up um is it you know right now if you applied to 20 jobs and didn't hear anything back then i would say that you know we are in a very challenging difficult time and that that might not be a sign of anything but in general in regular days um that there's a problem at that point if you apply to 20 or so and you're not really 
getting much feedback but this this device will help you figure out how many you're applying to and if you are um you know just kind of validate your efforts help you feel good and know that hey i added three to my list today and that feels great and then it will also um, if you're not really applying to as many as you might think because you're already frustrated or discouraged then at least you kind of become aware of that and uh, yeah. can start to address the motivation on a deeper level maybe maybe there's some other issues at play mental health wise right okay um let's move on to we're in the workplace now whether we're volunteering or we've we've, mm -hmm. we've landed the job and strategies for being social in the workplace i'm sure um this is there's a lot of this stuff that does come up you've got a number of things listed here um let's start with something we all need um especially this time stress management and uh mm -hmm. take us through some of the uh some of the ideas there Right. So the first thing that I encourage people to do um, when they're either when they've found a job or they're looking for work is is figuring out what their stress management could look like in a workplace where they may be envisioning themselves in soon. So can they what kinds of things, what kinds of strategies and uh, coping pieces can be put into play to help them have a more successful day? So is it taking more frequent breaks? Is it going for a little walk? Uh, those sorts of things. Um, how are they able to, I mentioned a stress ball earlier, how is someone able to manage throughout the day? Uh, it's really important to kind of write out all the strategies that you could possibly use that are uh, comfortable for you to be using in the workplace as a starting step, for sure, right? Um, okay. So that was that piece. And then the disclosure plan is really important as well, because that's it, we can't talk about being social at work until you've decided what you're doing with disclosure at work. Um, because if you decide that you are going to disclose, um, then that may impact the relationships that you have because maybe more people actually understand you a little bit more if you have disclosed um, or maybe you haven't and then there are more social pressures on you because you have to perform in, in a way that might not be as authentic, right? And there's no right or wrong, like I said with that, but you just gotta figure out what you're doing uh, so yeah. that your all your other following steps uh, make sense. Um, and then the next big one I have is establish a workplace mentor. And that's one of my favorite ones and one of the ones that I've truly found most successful with most people that I've worked with uh, in the last while, because it's really wonderful to have someone who's not your boss, who you can bounce ideas off of. Um, it, sometimes our bosses are not really like actually, they don't do the same job we do day to day, so they don't really know the ins and outs of how we actually navigate a day. Um, and also it's nice to have someone who, not, who isn't your boss, like able to talk to someone else to get perspective and get feedback and maybe ask for help um, who isn't your boss so you're not feeling like you're bothering your boss all the time because sometimes sometimes managers do end up quite busy and you know what that's um whether or not you've disclosed that's something that you can do what we see quite often when we're when people are like people who are who are really good at interviewing you feel as a as an employer that you're being interviewed yourself more than you're interviewing them sometimes you feel like you didn't get enough information out of it but one of the one of the things that people that are very career focused generally you've been around the block a few times and had a few jobs is they will ask those types of questions in the interview process or even after they get the job who's a good person for me to talk to mm -hmm. if it's even it's not a formal mentorship someone who's been through what I'm going through onboarding at a new company, someone who has a couple years experience, who's an example of what I want to accomplish here is mm. a good person. If not, and I know we're gonna get into friends and, and make yeah. work friends, but with social yeah. concerns that can sometimes be challenging, but even yeah. when it's not a challenge, the friends you make are based around whether you're a Star Wars fan or a Star Trek fan or whatever it might be. They may not be the right person that would be a good sounding board for you, like this mentor. And, and that is a, a great question to ask in an interview of your employer. Once you get hired, they will probably go, this person's looking to succeed and put you in, put you in touch with someone who's the best person. Like they're awesome at it. You'll learn so, so much from them. So it's a, it's a great tip. And whether you've disclosed or not, I think it's something that will go over very well in your uh, in your onboard or, or in your interview. Um, one to two work friends. That's your that's your next point. Um, yeah. Yes. Yes. And thank you for sharing that. That was really uh, that was really absolutely took the words out of my mouth. I think you really described that really nicely. Um, so one or two work friends. So I say this point because a lot of times when I meet with people, they think that they have to be friends with everybody on staff. 
And I have people who like get really stressed about that. So they're thinking, oh my goodness, I have to make sure that everybody really likes me. And then they're spending their whole day um, getting anxiety over like, how to connect and be social with everybody. And that's not really necessary at all. If you, like you said, if you can identify one or two people who work with you that might have common interests, then that's great. Um, and certainly it's not essential to have the whole team be your best friend and, and you want to obviously still keep things kind of professional you want to exude professionalism even with those work friends especially in the early days while you're figuring out if they may be the right choice that sort of thing uh so making sure that interest we're talking about are are uh are avoiding the hot topics like religion or politics those sorts of things but keeping things in the surface level uh initially right <clears throat> Um, and, uh, yeah, I mean, the people that are most social at work aren't always the best people. Again, another tip from an employer aren't always the best people to connect with, um, mm -hmm. because sometimes they're not getting enough of the job done and they may mm -hmm. not be around to be your friend, uh, shortly after that. Yeah. Um, uh, so I want to, I want to set a precedent here, everyone. We are, we're a little bit short on time. We've got a very useful tactical guide part coming up that I want to get to any of you whose questions were not answered. We are saving those questions. Um, Sarah, Autism Ontario, someone, not me, as I mentioned earlier, I'm nobody but the host. Someone's going to get back to you if we don't get to it, but we're going to try and stick to the content. And so if we have time at the end, we can sort of get some um, um, get some questions done. Um, the last few points that you have here are, you know, to help promote, you know, um, scheduling of diversity events. Um, mm -hmm. Uh, that's something that you've seen work is that's clearly that would be something yeah. I think you would like to do after you've been there for a bit and kind of know people, but talk a little bit about that. Yeah. So scheduling and diversity events, mental health, health, ASD specific, all are good to improve, uh, to promote inclusion and awareness. Right. So I do encourage that. I also encourage to script where possible to an extent. And that doesn't mean that you're saying everything, you know, this memorized script, but it is, I always encourage people to think, you know, you're seeing people at work on Monday. What's one thing that you may want to mention to them about your weekend? Maybe you ordered some really good Chinese food or something like that. And that might be an appropriate thing to share if anyone asks how your weekend was. But just kind of like thinking a little bit in advance of topics that you feel comfortable talking to people with around that water cooler chat, that small talk piece that's often not very comfortable and, and not very organic for many. So think a little bit about it in advance and, and just 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 a little bit, not a lot is necessary. And then, of course, lastly, asking for help is huge, right? It's very, very important to ask for help um, around being uh, having reduced social demands at work at uh, that sort of thing um, identifying mentors as you mentioned before uh, communication where you're struggling is very very important okay okay so you've uh, you've broken this down into a um, but is this a, a Sarah Sophie original the three C's yeah. is this uh, is this yeah. your, your your process we got the three C's um, for success here and it's context communication and checking in where did this come from um and um and how do you put this into, into your practice here okay yeah so this is this is kind of the way that i help people manage the um the social and figure out how to deal in social situations because every situation is so different we've mentioned many times that everybody on the spectrum is so different so what are some best practices in my opinion and i shouldn't say best practices but what are things that have worked with in my practice with my clients is, is as follows and when we have there's a there's another workshop coming up in two weeks that will be oh, another webinar just on being social and we're going to go through just a ton of different scenarios at that time and apply these few strategies then. Nice. Nice. Yeah, there'll be more time because I know we're short on time today. But what I would say is um, let's talk about context first. So context is when you have a problem come up, when you have something social communication wise that's not really going the way you want it to go, the first thing I want you to do is think about maybe even write down who's involved. Um, and then decide maybe by talking to a friend or your mentor or even like a family member or a friend outside of work, how serious of a problem is it, right? So I know that a lot of the work that I do with people is helping them identify, is it a big problem, a medium-sized problem, or a small problem? Because sometimes we have right. big reactions. It may feel like a big problem, but it may not actually be that big of a problem. So figuring out how big of an issue it actually is. And then the third thing is looking at timelines. How soon does it actually need to be resolved? Because a lot of people that I work with um, may turn to the kind of fight or flight situation and they may kind of like avoid conflict and avoid challenging situations and not want to direct them, uh, not want to address them directly. So figuring out how soon it needs to be resolved is really important because that will help you adapt how you may respond. And then 
communication would be the next component. Right. When you're in this issue, when you have this like this conflict come up, and it could be as simple as, you know, right now I'm thinking about a lot of people who are using Zoom online to communicate at work. And I'm thinking of a, a client who recently told me that, oh my goodness, now I see 40 people's faces on meetings, and that is super overwhelming for me, right? Yeah. So maybe the communication in that situation is talking to your manager, and you're going to say, um, uh, okay, what's the best way to reach my manager? What is the person I'm dealing with in this situation? What's their communication style? Um, maybe you know that email is best for them. Um, and then you think what's best for me as well, right? Because it's just as important. There's two people, it's 50-50. What's best for you? So maybe you figure out um, uh, a, an email that you can send to your manager or your request for time to talk to them. Um, and then you work through things. So has there been a miscommunication? Well, in this situation, no, it's just circumstances that now everything's online, but it's not working for you. Um, right. And then you think, how can I prepare to work through? How can I communicate through this? So what do you need out of the situation? You're thinking about that in advance before you actually send an email. Um, it's better to kind of step back and think, what do I need? How can I prepare to communicate and work through this? So I know that I, in this situation, maybe need to not have the camera on or that sort of thing when I'm on these calls. Um, but I need to tell my boss about that. What are the implications of that? How can I be prepared for those implications? And then the last bit, which I include, is the um, checking in. And that's, okay. super that's super important because uh, sometimes the situation isn't resolved in the moment. It's not always like right away, like the second that you have a conversation and things are all back normal and happy. Like if you've possibly offended someone or someone's offended you, then you need to think about, is there any way to kind of, is there any follow-up that I should have here? Um, particularly if someone's, you know, made, made an appropriate comment, something like that. You know, is there anyone else who needs to be involved in the situation? Do I need to go to a supervisor if a colleague's kind of offended me? What What are the next steps? What do I, what do, I do at a later point in time? Um, how do I manage through that? So those are three, three keys. Um, I was going to say it's all. I know we're running. We're running short. I think we're going to go a couple minutes late. If you don't, do you have to jump? Or are you able to give us two or three more minutes of your time, yeah, sir? I'm good. I'm good for sure. Okay. Mm -hmm. In the checking in thing, guys, that's one thing. Is, I just keep speaking from an employer perspective. You know, your managers and your employees are not are not perfect, and they generally, especially with what's going on right now, many things that are on the go, and they may start a process and may not clear with you how long it's going to take, and or it could get dropped, unfortunately. Right. Mm -hmm. So checking in is just. There's nothing wrong with it. No one's going, you know, nine times out of 10, when you check in on something that you raised to your manager or your employer, they are going to, the first words out of their mouth, they're going to be, I'm sorry. You know, mm -hmm. I remember that it was on my list. Unfortunately, I got tied up in X, Y, or Z, and they're going to say, I'm sorry, and it'll bring it back to the top of the pile. So it is, it is, it is very important. You mm -hmm. said there was three C's. There's actually an extra C. What's the, uh, what is the extra C there? So this C is not mine. This C okay. is complex. Solution and this C is adapted from the peers program. So peers is uh, this is an evidence based model um, that it helps people make and keep friends. Um, but I've applied it to the work context. So um, for conflict resolution, there's just a few steps here. I'm not going to go through them all in detail right now, yeah. but I would suggest that you have a read through this slide and think about is are you currently using these steps in your personal communication with conflict resolution? And also, could you be applying any of these to a professional um, situation? Situation as well. It's just a lot of listening first, empathizing, uh, making sure that people know that you're listening and they, that you're hearing what they're saying, then sharing a little bit about your side. And then at the very end, always kind of coming up with what can you do next time that might work a little bit better. Okay. So we pushed you to burn through that, that, that end um, of that presentation. Um, mm -hmm. I'm going to give you one. I want to get one more tactical thing in there. This person's asked a question and I think it should be, uh, you should have an answer for it. And from there, I'll give you your moment of Zen and we can talk about the next, our next webinars. What is a good approach to um, ask for more hours with your current employers? You've got a job, but they, maybe hours have been reduced. What's a good approach right now for asking for more hours? Uh, so the way that I would approach it uh, right now, like given that we're in the midst of COVID-19, if you're still working and you're working safely and that's 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 uh, an essential service happening, then I think what you could do is check in. Like you said a moment ago, Matt, like a lot of times when you check in with managers, um, when you check in with supervisors, they're they're maybe apologizing because they because they forgot something or they're also the other thing I see is that they're thanking you for bringing things up. Um, right. So. 
if you reach out, it's not going to ever show, the only thing that's gonna show is that you have initiative, right? It's going to only speak positively, as long as you're not reaching out again and again and again and again, because then that's kind of nagging, and then that might be a sign of not so great communication that you're not getting the message that the hours are not available. But I would say reach out, um, and suggest that you might be available for extra hours. Um, we know that, particularly right now, life is very complicated for a lot of people. So I know that some companies are offering for people with um, young children and families that they can work reduced hours um, and obviously reduce pay for that time. But um, in those situations, and somebody does need to be there to flex up and take on the extra hours. So letting your employer know you're available is a good idea. Um, as well, uh, it, this depends on your comfort, but sometimes roles look different right now. So I know that someone that I work with who used to work in a restaurant, she used to be a manager of a restaurant. Right now she's doing all the social media for the restaurant and the back end coordination of um, making sure that they can do curbside delivery. Uh, yeah. So you know, jobs may look different right now, but there might be pieces that are available for you to pick up if you want extra hours. And that may not be an easy thing. So it's a very case by case kind of situation. I don't know what your skill set looks like um, and what you're comfortable with in terms of change and adapting, but that could be an option as well. Yeah, all of our lives have changed with this. I mean, I'm getting my own coffee now when we're in the studio, we get taken care of, but um, but it is a quicker commute home. Sarah, thanks so much for all the time. I know we went a little long, everyone. Thanks for your participation. We have a number of questions that have come in that have thanked you, so this is very informative. Just to remind people, we've got some sessions that are upcoming with you. Um, you can go to Autism Ontario to find that, um, and they're going to dive a lot deeper into the actual um um, strategies around the uh, the social interaction. Uh, this webinar is going to be recorded and it's going to be available on um, on the Autism Ontario website later on today. Uh, tell your friends, loved ones, anyone you believe will um, will uh, find it interesting. And um, we've got a short survey that we've got up here that we want people to complete to let us know what other topics you would like us to cover during this time. Don't forget to visit the resource section. There's a lot in there, including this PowerPoint, which has got a ton of stuff at the end to help you out. If your questions weren't answered, we'll try and get them back for you. And on behalf of Sarah, myself, and Autism Ontario, we look forward to seeing you at our next Autism Ontario event.